It all starts with perception. What if our perception of the world and its many inhabitants expanded? Every being has a different vantage point. When we truly know a soul, we find solace. Asking questions with an open mind and heart is how we learn how to relate to one another. Relational healing goes beyond the surface level. When we listen to someone on a deeper level, we fear less and love more. We're all teachers. Every being on this planet has a gift that is meaningful to share. This podcast is about expanding our vision and illuminating the threads that weave us together as a community. Simply put, this podcast is about lessons in love. Welcome to Unified Threads. Hello, light beams. Welcome to season two, episode 05, Possibility. Possibility, a noun, a thing that may happen or be the case. There always was the possibility that he might be turned down, the state or fact of being likely or possible, a thing that may be chosen or done out of several possible alternatives. Example, this idea has great possibilities. Welcome to the episode been taking a break for about a year, uh, really doing some inner work and getting some stuff done that I have needed to get done in the material realm. Um, but now we're diving right in uh, to, to really talk about some subjects that are truly important to me and my heart's work, uh, dismantling white supremacy and also still having a sense of belonging while simultaneously healing the harm and addressing the trauma uh, caused by colonization. So today we're speaking with Ethan Hughes from the Possibility Alliance and Grace Yoder from Polywog Farms will also be joining us. Ethan is one of four co-founders of the Possibility Alliance. The Possibility Alliance is referred to as the PA throughout this episode. I first heard about the PA's work a couple years ago from Grace about the time that her and I did a recording for this podcast. And I decided to look him up online because I was really interested to know a bit more about how they came up with their guiding principles. At the time, there were five whenever Grace told me about them. And I heard Ethan from a podcast she shared called Permaculture Podcast right around the time that I was just starting to learn about permaculture and, and what that is. But I decided, let me call him up and see what else they're involved in. And I found online that they had moved to Maine since that permaculture podcast interview those two interviews that you'll see in the show notes were in 2012 and 2013 um, but since then yeah they moved to Maine from Missouri uh, they've changed their their life quite a bit they've expanded their their vision if you will and their work has shifted and in this episode we'll be scratching the surface on that shift and also on uh, sharing some around the analysis that Ethan's group has come to when it comes to finding pathways out of empire, which they're constantly reevaluating and continuing to deepen their their analysis. Um, so we do hope that if you listen to this episode and you have thoughts, feedback, questions, that you'll reach out to us because we definitely want to keep in touch and have as many voices as possible involved in uh, just this willingness to see th- things as they are and how we can uh, work together, weaving together as many threads of us um, and our gifts and talents as possible to create a new world and a new way of being together uh, that centers and, and prioritizes taking care of not just ourselves, but also each other and the planet. It was recorded on August 7th of 2019. And so without further ado, uh, let's dive right into our conversation with Ethan and Grace. It's ringing. Hello. 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 Hi. Is this Ethan? It is. Awesome. This is Amy. Hi, I'm Grace. I am thrilled to welcome Ethan Hughes from the Possibility Alliance in Belfast, Maine, and Grace Yoder, a friend and neighbor here in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where I live. We're recording this conversation at the Fundamental Sound Co. in Ipsy. I'd like to give a big shout out to my friend Taylor, who will be helping to produce and mix this episode. And of course, welcome Ethan and Grace to the podcast. Hi, Grace. Wonderful to meet you through our voices. I feel a lot of trust just the conversation with you, Amy, and hearing about your feedback, Grace, is seeming like we're 
I'm perfectly on a very similar journey to to learn and grow with all the white supremacy and patriarchy. So I just feel very comfortable with um, your guiding. So thank you. Your best. And Ethan's on the phone with us uh, from his tiny house in, on 10 acres in Belfast. And Grace is here with me in the studio. You're probably going to recognize her voice if you've listened to this podcast because she was on the very first episode of this season. She shared her heart work on the episode called Belonging. You can find at unifiedthreads.com and in the show notes of this podcast. She shared the Possibility Alliance's work with me around the same time uh, through a Best of Permaculture podcast episode that featured two interviews that Ethan did with the host, uh, whose name's Scott Mann, back in 2012 and 2013. So again, we'll be sure to link to Grace's episode on this podcast where we first got into this topic, as well as the podcast where we first heard about Ethan's work. You'll be able to find those links in the show notes whenever you want to circle back and hear how this work has evolved for all of us. So Ethan and Grace, welcome to Unified Threads. I'm so excited to have both of your voices and energies with us today and honored. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's a it's an honor to be here. Thanks. Well, let's just dive right in. For those of you that have may not have yet heard of your work, Ethan, um, one of your guiding principles that really caught my attention is, I think you call it creating pathways out of empire, or I also wrote it down as creating pathways out of the dominant culture. And we'll dive deeper into those guiding principles later on in the conversation. But to get us started, can you give us a brief history of the Possibility Alliance and how it came into being? Yeah, I'll try to, is that 30 <laughs> seconds, three minutes? You have as much time as you need. I say brief, but I figured as much time as you need, there's probably been a lot that's gone on with that. Just however you want to explain it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll start with like the first, I grew up in Gloucester, Massachusetts, public school outside of Boston, and um, the first real path that led was my my dad was, hit and killed by a drunk driver and my mom instead of pressing charges joined mad mothers against drunk driving and i started to realize there's a lot more cost to this industrial white supremacist culture that nobody was telling me about in um, public school and then my next immersion was i went abroad to ecuador with school of international training and wound up in ecuador during the time of the oil pipeline spill that went into Agua Rico and worked with Confenii and Conai, two indigenous groups, as uh, twice the Valdez was being washed down into indigenous territory and watching the genocide and oppression. That was a huge change. I almost dropped out of college and led to a lot of questioning. And then that pathway led me to give up flying and, and give up things that were connected to things that were both oppressing people and the ecosystem I loved. And that um, arc led me to, in 1999, kind of jump off and leave driving automobiles and gave away an inheritance of $100,000 to both ecosystems and people in need and just tried to I had to do something. Uh, the psychic energy was so huge. It led to um, my partner that I thought I was going to marry leaving me, and all my family thought for sure I was going to be alone. And then I met my partner now, who I have two children with, Sarah, and the co founder of Possibility Alliance, Sarah Wilcox. And when she found out, I just biked and loved to. Um, opened my home to whoever needed to be there. She saw that as wonderful. And then we had this vision of um, Pathways Out of Empire, which we called the time radical simplicity. Our our analysis has been changing as we go. And that led us to take a boat to France where we lived in a, a community that was inspired by people living with Gandhi who started a project after World War II in France after Nazi occupation. And that's when our minds got blown. We we're living in a place where they grew all their food. They're doing direct actions and facing 10 years in prison while blocking GMO food, welcoming illegal, you know, illegal by the domination system, immigrants from North Africa um, to their place and all done in the gift economy. And we brought that back 
to the United States to start the Possibility Alliance, um, inspired by living there for a year and a half and learning from them. Both they lived without electricity, grew their own food while doing... The, the real root that blew our mind was the integral. They did self-transformation to remove racism and hatred in themselves, and then they expressed it with community uplift by welcoming anyone for free and teaching, and then they did defense of life and activism by shutting down nuclear weapon plants and, and realizing we have to get in the way of the domination system. So that kind of integral three is what began our our journey in America. So that's how we started the Possibility Alliance, and it was um, Sarah and myself and a friend, Helena Marcus, and Katrina Gimbel, where the, they had spent time in France with us, and that was the crew that launched in Missouri in 2007. Gotcha. How'd I do? That was great. <laughs> I, I, I learned something. There, I, I learned something that I don't think I knew um, that you had lived in that community in France. I didn't know about that. Yeah. I feel like I had read an article that just mentioned that community, but I didn't realize it had offered you such a template for what you ended up doing in Missouri. Are they still operating? It is not. Um, what, I mean, it's, it's trying to. We were there for the last year before it shifted some of its direction. Um, so when we were leaving, they were electrifying and getting internet and, and making different choices. A small group that were our mentors relocated to northern Maine, uh, north sorry, northern France, and are continuing that work. Um, the one thing that really blew us away is we were in Oregon with this vision of like we got to be able to live outside domination. We've got to get out of capitalism. And all these people we admired were like, there's no way you're going to run a sustainable forest without a chainsaw. There's no way you're not going to charge money. So we had no evidence. And so when we found the ark, they were doing inner work. It was interfaith and non-faith. They were doing community uplift. Just everything we sat on was carved there by hand and incredible art and singing and dancing twice a week and live music and also the social justice um, and activism. So we saw it and we're like, oh, our our vision wasn't crazy. You know, it, it helped us. Living that really helped the embodiment. I don't think we would have been able to do it without that experience. I noticed in a Boston Globe interview you did in, I think it was June of this year, one of the quotes in that is, you give up something f small for something larger. And that was in reference, I believe, to the moment you made up your mind not to use automobiles anymore. So I was just curious if you still felt this way about sacrifice and if you would say that it had something to do with why you relocated or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I still love that de definition, which I think I mentioned in Scott Mann's interview, but that sacrifice is giving something up of lesser value for something of greater value. And yeah, there was a lot of sacrifice in leaving. We had built up these structures after 11 years and, um, you know, we're starting over and taking those risks. And part of it, and there's many reasons for the move, and one of them was we believe we're in a existential crisis. We're in a climate emergency. We're seeing the, you know, the white supremacist systems are becoming stronger and not being dismantled. Um, mass shooting, suicide, you, you name it. We're in a cultural, planetary, ecological emergency. And though we had amazing neighbors in rural Missouri and would really do so much for us, there was a different worldview where seven out of eight didn't believe in climate change, and there was a different analysis. So it was, we really felt like we needed to be somewhere where we could help organize and help um, build resiliency in response. So um, that was part of the move. But yeah, I I still I think we're all facing this huge sacrifice. Is basically if we don't. We'll, we're going to go extinct and take a lot of species with us. So we're at this, you know, challenging moment where it's no longer, uh, should we shift? You know, 11 years ago, people thought we were pretty irrelevant living by candlelight 
without petroleum and each year because of the emergency we we in a way become more relevant um it's very imperfect but we're saying we're not waiting for governments to not just get out of oil but also block it we're not just living by candlelight we're also showing up and locking down on the keokuk block of the dapple or sending people to standing rock um most recently risking arrest with the extinction rebellion in boston that both are happening and so when a lot of people say well what are we going to do without oil i can actually say well come visit you know we're trying to hit it from both sides i hit it probably isn't a good embody it on both sides but yeah there's always sacrifice but i think of what's of greater value is species and life and cultures what's of greater value than that so it seems like we should be able to sacrifice all the rest of it so can i just ask a clarifying question about the move um, yeah what about belfast maine provided that like big, larger cultural opportunity i don't know like i'm getting the sense that you wanted more like outside involvement and to generate more more of like an Im cultural immune response I don't know is that yeah so I mean it this, this is where it gets complicated <laughs> at first um, many things happened when we were envisioning I grew up in the Gulf of Maine in Gloucester Massachusetts so I have family here and connections and when um, when we were imagining that our time in Missouri was, was complete, I was pointing in that direction and reached out to Project Wabanaki and reached out to the Penobscot and talked about how we were doing reparations and how we were, how we were living and said, hey, we, we first, if we relocate, we want to make sure it's useful to the Penobscot whose land I'm currently occupying um, and how to navigate that. So that was one when those conversations went really, really well and we sent information about our project and they said this would be great to have your presence and have you economically supporting our work and, and serving that work. So that was a big piece. We were really moved by the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission that happened in Maine in 2015 by the work of Esther and others and which became Wabanaki Reach. And so we saw incredible, resilient, strong uh, communities, um, Passamaquoddy and Micmac and others. So we were drawn to uplift that work. So that, that for me, was a big draw to Maine. Um, and just so you all know, I, we're in a, we live in a 500-square-foot home, and we live in communities, so there's, it's, it's a thunderstorm, so there will probably be a lot of people coming in from outside who live here at the project. So if you hear noise in the background, that's what's happening. <laughs> this podcast is all about community, and, so that's totally fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, was a big, that was a big piece, and also I feel more vulnerable about this piece and, and sharing it publicly is that um, in winter solstice years ago, I had a, I'm not a big dream rememberer, like nighttime dreams. And um, I had a series of 40 dreams in 60 days uh, that were super vivid. Um, many of them were really like 500 year old looking women who came up to me on the coast and said, you need to go to Maine. And I went to France in my dream. My mentor Robert was like, why aren't you in Maine? And so all these dreams, every single one of them, my daughter was in Maine pulling up these shiny objects from the ocean saying, you need to be in Maine. And so I had all these dreams and my partner, uh, by the 13th dream said, well, why don't we just go up there? You know, you go home to Gloucester to visit your mom and brother and so that was a big piece, and when I spoke that, there was a lot of mainly uh, women, friends, that said, it's about time we start doing something other than rational, like, let's listen to our dreams. But it was vulnerable to be, you know, the whole community that circled around us to be like saying one of our initiatives is we're following the non-literal unconscious, which um, that's something I think is for me undoing patriarchy is is not using reason um to find our way so yeah i feel really vulnerable sharing that like publicly but 
dreams really influenced it for me. It was like the piece that um, really moved me on a deeper level. Um, Belfast had activism and groups working with Wabanaki Reach and other groups like uh, Healing Turtle Island, Sherry Mitchell's amazing work, who's also an amazing Penobscot activist and leader. But um, as it got closer, I felt Belfast was, you know, it's a mainly white state because of the occupation of the indigenous peoples. And uh, I actually at the last moment wanted to go to either Detroit, where we've done a lot of work, or Oakland, where we do, have done work, or Harrisonburg, all projects we'd worked with that were just in the middle of both the um, racism and corporate insanity. So at that point, I was like, I think we need to move right to the heart of the struggle. And my two daughters, Etta and Isla and Sarah, did not want to do that. So three to one, I chose to continue the path to Maine. So that's some of it. That's a lot. But <laughs> I love that uh, you shared the thing about your dreams because Amy and I were just talking about the significance of dreams and wanting to listen to them more, like, 10 minutes, Literally I don't know, on the right like on, here. on yeah. the right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Yeah. Um, we both looked at each other as you were saying it. The so dream. thank you for being vulnerable with us. Um, but I'm curious about uh, what, what kind of social impact the decision to move had on your community, because I just, just in my imagination, you know, it seemed to be this really vibrant place, like, yeah, committed, and I don't know. But what was the yeah. impact, and did people come with you? or? Yeah, that's a great question. As we started to shift in that direction, um, you know, we had landed there, just Sarah and I coming off the boat from Europe and biking there. Sarah's five months pregnant, and we had no idea what was going to happen, and we didn't expect what happened is growing where a land trust sprung up next to us in the Peace and Permaculture Center. A Catholic worker farm um, spread out next to us and people moving in around us. And it became this wonderful pocket of um, love and resistance and in, in connecting to the land with all the complexity of knowing we were also on traditional hunting land of the Missouri and, and other Iowa and other tribes. Um, but there was a certain point where the core members of the PA at that time just all at the same moment felt like our personal work is done here. And eight other adults stayed behind. And basically all those projects, because we were the real hub, having about a 1,000 visitors a year and had enough apprentices and interns where we were often always able to send two people a week to Ferguson when Michael Brown was murdered and racism was revealed and we were able to send literally over 20 people from our project went to Standing Rock and some were embedded for six months. And so we had this critical mass. And so when we wanted to move, the remaining folks said, we want to keep going. And that allowed us to shift. Uh, I think if the Possibility Alliance would have just everyone would have just left. It would have been much harder to leave. So they've renamed themselves Bear Creek Community Land Trust. They've umbrellaed the Possibility Alliance land, and now they have a 200-acre uh, land trust continuing the work of uh, resistance and simplicity and education. And um, and it was hard. We When we came to Missouri, we said we're going to be here for life. We're committing to this long haul and the mobility that comes with white privilege and all the ways it breaks our connections, you know, it was a really hard decision. And when the new math came out of both the climate crisis and the continued genocide of black and brown and indigenous people, we, we felt we needed to respond in a new way. But it was really hard. A lot of people were rightly so upset um, after they had hand built their homes next to us and all of a sudden we were leaving. Um, there was some conflict, you know, we, we attempted for, for several years to find a match of an indigenous community or project that wanted to take over our land as our final shift. 
and because we are 250 miles from any uh, reservation or, or concentration of the different nations, we there was nobody interested, so we had a complex decision where we decided to lower the cost by roughly $100,000 for those coming into the PA and then free up 120000 which we have freed up, 130000 freed up to go to indigenous groups around the country that are repurchasing their stolen land. And it's very complex because it breaks the gift economy um, but we started to realize the gift economy was in a bubble of white privilege and white supremacy, and it was we were moving around things, but it was a lot of stolen goods. So if I rob a bank and then share it with everybody, um, maybe that's not a good uh, metaphor because the banks are you know stealing money all the time. But if I was to take something from somebody and then distribute it, and it was actually theft, you're breaking the universal law of the gift economy. So we started to realize the gift economy wasn't wasn't really what we fully believed in. So we shifted to a term, the give back economy, which is we have to return what was stolen before we can actually really embody this universal giving as the sun gives to the earth, like that wonderful Hafiz poem. The sun, after all this time, never says, you owe me to the earth. And looks what happens. It lights up the whole world. Like To realize, wow, we're, we're, we're really needing to shift our analysis. So this was hard for people because they're like, you're breaking the gift economy. I'm like, well, I'm kind of radicalizing. I hope in my vision of this is stolen from the history of slavery and from genocide and theft of land. And this is my best and perfect way to to answer this and it was there was a lot of uh, conflict about it um and i did we did the best we could collectively to answer all these questions and so we hope people who are coming into the land trust know that as they purchase land you know mainly white people purchase land way under the market value that a lot of that money is going to reparations and um it's complex getting out of capitalism. So there is, yeah, there is, there is hurt feelings and some of the relationships were strained because we did break our word. We said we're going to be there for life. And as we shifted, the experiment worked and led us elsewhere. And, um, yeah, but the great, you know, what I'm excited about is Bear Creek Community Land Trust is moving forward and getting new people moving in and all of our fruit trees and hand-built straw bales are being lived in. And meanwhile, another part of the collective, Dan and Margaret, um, who got married, were drawn originally to Maine, but now in Vermont, and teamed up with three other prior apprentices of the PA. Um, Phoenix had been there for three years, and Jesse and Tahira, who biked from Vermont to the Possibility Alliance in Missouri. And they're forming a either Possibility Alliance or a Possibility Alliance sister project in Vermont, and then we're starting in Maine. And we have um, right now three people living with us who visited us in Missouri and stayed in touch. So we have a crew of um, five adults and, and our daughters um, with a lot of visitors coming in to help. So that's kind of how the shift has happened. So I see it as three emerging experiments along with the sister projects, both in Reno and Kansas City and rural California. So it feels even though it's heartbreaking, it feels like a lot needs to be smashed and broken up to free up energy for, for this crisis. So, yeah. I'm um, remembering something that you said in the Scott Mann podcast about how you hope you hoped that you look totally different in 10 years. Um, <laughs> yes. And like, here, here you go. It, it's not even 10 years later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the hard thing. We always call ourselves an experiment. And, you know, we're in the inside of it. So at the PA, we're welcoming people like Christine Nobis of Indigenous Iowa, who works with missing and murdered Indigenous women and, and children. And so she's so courageously coming for the weekend to visit us in a white space and sharing with us and doing amazing work after Standing Rock with Little Creek Camp and 
Um, she also works with Seeding Sovereignty, an Indigenous Women Collective, Writing Collective. And, you know, so we're sitting with these people and building relationships. Most of the neighbors or the people who know the PA nationally aren't having those conversations. So as we're shifting, it's happening within the experiment. So sometimes when things shift, it's shocking to the outside because they haven't been part of the process that have made us be like, we're kind of the gift economy can actually be in a bubble of white supremacy and white privilege. It doesn't mean it's not great that it's taking on capitalism, but it ha if we just hold it there, it's not going to evolve to actually true justice. So, you know, this is the challenge is people are like, wait, you're already not charging any money and doing permaculture as a gift and, and no one was salaried and nothing was for sale. This was so radical. And you're saying we have to do more now. I'm like, yes. Like, that's where the experiment has led us. Like we're actually, we're, we're, we're moving around stolen goods. And, I, you know, I'll have talked to Charles Eisenstein and, and we just had a letter exchange and he wrote, um, you know, the gift economy book, Sacred Economics. And, you know, I'll also realize that it was light on the analysis of, of white supremacy and racial injustice and genocide. So, it needs to be evolved or it's going to be meaningless for 75% of the planet, um, 80% of the planet, the global majority as Barbara Love calls it a wonderful, um, black leader in Amherst. It's like, we have to, we have to think of 7 billion humans in our history. If we're going to move these radical progressive white things forward, they're, they become meaningless to those most oppressed if we don't radicalize. You're blowing my mind right now. I'm such a student of like gift economy and a fan of Charles Eisenstein, but you are totally right. It's n like we have to get really honest about what it is we're yeah. even exchanging. That's very powerful. I'm really grateful you're and, sharing that. And, ha and how to hold up Eisenstein is also with his work and analysis, I, I think he's brilliant. He, he also has moved me and radicalized my own experiments. And so it's how to see the whole is like, we started having to do a lot of shame work. Brene Brown, if you've read Daring Greatly, and it's so important because people will start coming to the PA and we're talking about white supremacy and being part of the domination system. And Sherry Mitchell says, rape of women and rape of the earth are the same thing. Um, it's, it's deep, terrifying stuff. And so we started to have to do shame as a shame. Resiliency is our first thing when people came for a week, because they're going to go through a week of the impact of capitalism and extraction and that we're all feeling, including us trapped. We're, we're so far from being out of the domination system after trying really hard with a lot of privilege is, is, um, what we're hoping um, we do is our friend Remy from the Indian Problem, who's Dene, has done amazing work uh, to, for the liberation of himself and his nation, says, like, you, you keep weaponizing your privilege. Like, yeah, how do we use it to shift? And without working on shame and self-love, it's so much on us right now. We, in, in, in our lifetime, have taken out half the life on the planet. In our lifetime, we're here because of the largest genocide known in human history. 85 million. Um, Eighty-five million human beings that were wiped out in North and South America. Thousands of nations. And we're now, you know, we're doing grief work. So, like, I can cry on an interview because I'm not going to hold it in my body. I'm going to speak it, and it's going to be part of the healing. So we're doing grief work weekly and shame work just so that we can not fall into white fragility and not turn away. But that's the piece is, like, we have to stop shaming and blaming in the social justice movement because it shuts us down. And um, I'm amazed when friends who are not white or do not identify as hetero 
whether they're non-binary or identify as trans, like that they can, after all the oppression, like love me and welcome me into being part of the change. Like it's, Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I realized like, I am not the, I'm not the solution. Like I, we watched, we, we heard about city of joy, which is a group of women in the Congo that, uh, because of the coltane and mining went through incredible, horrific rape and murder of their family. And they went through the city of joy, uh, which was a healing place to create them as leaders. And I was at the V day for ending violence against women. And a, a few women who had been to Africa said like these women who are now with open heart, love demanding, demanding with fierce love change are the most powerful people on the planet because they've been through the unthinkable and came out to the other side and healed the trauma of war and sexual terrorism. And that's where I'm like, yeah, like who do I actually want to follow? Like, yeah, Eisenstein or I, I'm, because of my privilege, may be articulate, but like those are the spiritual warriors um, that we need to follow because they've been through it all and came out on the other end choosing unity and not separation and choosing liberation and not perpetuating violence. And it becomes um, just mind-blowing to realize the real resiliency and strength lies in these marginalized cultures that we've silenced and pushed out of history. And so, yeah, it's just, it's a time to get behind, including our youth. Yeah. Thank you for holding. We talked about on their phone call before this call, I think it's important to name that we are an all white group on this podcast right now. And on the next conversation, maybe we'll bring in someone, if they're willing to, to chat with us, that can broaden that perspective. But I do want to mention that since folks can't, are not able to see us, that we are all white on this call. And so we're all sitting in that same kind of space of blind spots. And that's why we wanted to have these conversations with each other. Yeah. And that, yeah, it's so beautifully said that we're going to continually miss so much and, but keep keep digging in and that it's the Wabanaki reach training uh, Barbara and others who opened the training start by saying we're here because of genocide now what like we have to start there if we're going to actually create medicine in ourselves and our communities to heal it but it's yeah it's a, we need to we need each other for this work and I think to be courageous enough to my friend Carlos from Detroit who does amazing work with the poor people's campaign said, you know, Ethan, we can, we can walk shoulder to shoulder without having be in the same room. There are times when we, we have to be separate. Those who identify as white have to do their work in times when we come together. But I, I also think we need to listen to the lead of all people of color and all all oppressed groups when they say we need to be with ourselves right now and not take it personally. And I, I think that was so beautifully said that when we realize we're spiritually connected, we can walk side by side and the possibility alliance is an all white group can do its work. And we're still connected to these amazing one friend, Ian, who's Japanese American. He came to the possibility alliance for a year and then went to Detroit and radicalized and they started a, a taproot sanctuary it's electricity free and a lot of we're honored that a lot of the wisdom came from uh, he took from the pa and it's a it's a it's a poc only space people of color it's like a safe space to do this work of crafts and 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 electricity free living and justice without having to deal with white fragility and microaggressions and that's beautiful that's i want to hold that up and get behind that and and um also saying the Possibility Alliance is all informed by nature-based and indigenous people around the world. Like we're, we're just trying to find the, find our way. We, we, 
we need to remember our ancestry and our traditions to make it authentic so we're not appropriating but we're appreciating as um sherry mitchell says so it's yeah there's just so much inner and outer work to be done at this moment in human history and we we have to be devastated and and uncomfortable constantly um something's coming up for me around just all this talk of grief work um i follow an author named stephen jenkinson um i don't know if you're familiar with him his definition of grief was really clarifying for me he defines it as the willingness to see things as they are and um Mm. I just, that has been a helpful tool for me in, like, thinking about how to practice grief outside of what people usually think of the places for grief, you know? Um, And I just see you, like, the way you're talking, it feels like you're just that willingness. I don't know. Um, Yeah, can you say that quote again? Yeah, um, he calls it the willingness to see things as they are. Mm. But he also talks about it as a skill, you know, not something that you can get on top of and then be done with. That it's it's about you know building muscle. That you can you can't yeah. you can't stop doing it, but you can do it better and more skillfully. Yeah. And all yeah. of that's been really, yeah. And that's just that came up. I wanted to offer that up because it feels like the kind of work that you're doing. Yeah, and and I think, I don't think, I have great compassion because there's times when I would stop weep, start weeping and it won't end for days and I think it will never end and it's terrifying to be so filled with, we're interconnected so we're feeling every mass shooting, we're feeling every unarmed black person who's shot, like we're part of it, the, the death of 100 species or more a day and we're not talking about it and processing it, so no wonder we're going crazy. But it, I, I just, how, how to have compassion as we enter that, that when I do grief work, all of a sudden, as uh, another person's work who worked with Sabon Fu from Africa, and it's um, the Wild Edge of Sorrow, Francis Weller, who named the five gateways of grief, just says, like, the other coin of grief is, is joy. Like the joy that he says the most intimate human experience is grief. Like when we share grief, grief is a a symbol of how much we love something. It's a memory. When we grieve the ones we've loved, it's a memory. Like Sherry Mitchell, who's the Penobscot leader, is like, yeah, anytime I learn about extinction, I like grieve. I like feel it because I I don't want to forget. And when we when we have practice of of group grieving. It's one of the most powerful community glues culturally in the United States is basically the Western culture has let go of that. And so we're frightened of it because we don't have that muscle. We think we're going to be overwhelmed by it. And I I think Joanna Macy's work, grieving leads to action. We can look at Greta, one of my heroes, who's just was, was, silent and so depressed and she processed that grief and it led to this act that has now been moving millions of youth to action um and i think if we reclaim grief as a transformational power that spirit and life is just wanting us to face and we just keep getting more addicted and distracted and and for different people depending on your trauma you might some people need a group of 20 people holding their grief. So we all have to also honor our capacity. Like you said, I love what you said. It's just we have to keep building that muscle, the risk muscle, the grieving muscle, the muscle to be shame resilient. And it's, um, and it's hard. I, 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 in our network, forming a national group for climate action and, and racial and gender justice and, and pathways out of empire, um, some of the amazing women uh, asked us four hours in on one of our meetings. They're like, are any of the white men uncomfortable right now? And we're like, no, we feel great. We're so connected. And they're like, we're not. 
then doing the real work. Like actually when I start working to undo patriarchy, I'm in a new realm or undoing my own inner uh, addiction to, to industrial society or white supremacy. I'm no longer in control. I'm in a place, and so now that's my net new indicator. It's like if I'm feeling uncomfortable, a paradigm is shifting, and it's a good thing. Like Brene Brown says, we need to normalize being uncomfortable because that's where real vulnerability and real connection happen. Um, and industrial society on purpose has us overwhelmed so we don't feel like we have the capacity for grief work or healing work, or, and that's where we need to come together to give spaces for that. So that's just, again, that's our experience. It's our experience that without that, we couldn't continue on our trajectory, mm-hmm. and it may not be true for everyone else. Well, in your experiences, what do you think either propels or stops a group, the otherwise well-meaning missioned work, from moving into a deeper relationship with the grief that is connected with land occupation and white supremacy? Do you have some personal experiences or lessons about what propelled or stopped that for you or other folks you've worked with? Yeah, I can only speak from those I'm most closest to in my own personal experiences that, you know, there are days where I am so dedicated to moving resources or support to indigenous communities for their, so they can lead their own liberation and be given some resources back from so much has been taken and a lot so the most important things can't be given back, genocide and loss of land and cultural appropriation and children being pulled out of families, that I get so heartbroken and then dedicated that I'll be so dedicated that I'll just, I will drive towards moving resources where I start to actually replay patriarchal structures. Um, I won't honor the limits of my beloved Sarah. And that becomes part of domination. And so for me, it gets, I just feel that I'm not capable. It's too much. And so when I'm like distant from my most close ally who's been an equal participant in all ways to birth the possibility alliance and in more ways way beyond what I can offer that I just feel I don't have enough of belonging and there's too much conflict in relationships and I just turn away. I I can't look at another doorway of devastation. It's like Rumi says like the path to love, the door is devastation. Like you fall and in falling you're giving wings but on some days I, I'm honestly like, I don't want to fucking fall today. Mm-hmm. I'm tired and disconnected. I can relate to and that. So it's the re- yeah, it's the resiliency to be with a group of people. Like uh, the work our network is working on is this two simple things of like intention and impact. Like a lot of times we have an intention for healing and the impact um, does otherwise, you know, even though. And if we can separate those and realize, I know your intention was good, but here's how it impacted me. Our nervous system relaxes because people are at least seeing our intention. And I think that happens in so many activist cells. We just focus on impact and we forget to acknowledge, like, I really trust you were trying to uplift me or help me, but here's how it impacted me. And I think once we realize we're, I mean, Brene Brown says the most terrifying thing is to be socially rejected. It's like being punched in the face. The hormones that are released in our body are more as or more intense than actually being physically punched. So we're so terrified, especially in our white culture that our ancestry is broken and we don't have roots back to our indigeneity. Um, we were terrified of, of being our whole self, including our brokenness. And so I think hiding and all these things add to us stopping. It was just like certain people on the PA journey as we started to do, you know, people pointed out our patriarchal structures and we started to bring in people to help us. And, and for some 
and people it's like gosh i'm i'm just trying to end my addiction to coffee and chocolate like come on you know like how do we how do we be how can we be equally risk taken equally have a healing saw salve for each other you know and and we're we're perfectly trying to learn that here um so i think that's why that's why i can only say that's why i know i i reach that point it's like i'm i'm some days i'm barely keeping my connection with my partner and love sarah and my daughter is as healthy as i want it but it also is sounding to me like you garner more strength for that particular grief work when you're in community around it and you have that shared process so it just strikes me as the right direction to keep doing it and keep absolutely and you don't have to live in community like we're starting a community grief circle with people in and around belfast that will meet and just starting to just invite and see who shows up like we're gonna do some grieving together and speaking it and, and changing conversations you know it's hard like we're all forgetting when i'm in downtown belfast people are like how are you doing and i always if i connect i'm like you know what for a time of global extinction i'm, I'm pretty uh overwhelmed and heartbroken but i'm thankful for your life like i start the conversation and it throws people off because they just want to be like hey my organic carrots are doing great that's also <laughs> true i'm blessed to see carrots growing in my garden but i also just want to keep naming publicly which is it, and it takes, in the reverse, is like we just have to be so, we've come up with the term in this network. I think Tim DeChristopher came up with the term, who's been part of the network, and he, he did beautiful work. He went to federal prison for, he was bitter 70 for blocking the sale of land in Utah and went through the prison for two years. And, you know, just remarkable journey. And he's like, Nonviolence, none of this captures it. We need fierce vulnerability, just like the undefended self. And, and I think that's so true. Like, if, I think if we're really being vulnerable, I'd be seeing eight people crying at any one moment in the co op. And we've normalized that at the PA when someone really has energy move. Someone could be on the floor in our kitchen crying. Someone's with them, and we're like, Are you okay? We're okay. And so people are cooking around them, and people are chatting and playing guitar in the other room that it's, it's as long as they have what they need we can actually laugh and cry publicly it's okay and they actually feel much better when the whole room doesn't stop they feel like okay great i actually am processing this grief and everybody is doing what they need to do like that's the kind of culture we're striving to move for move towards and honor and move you know move towards that direction where all spectrums can be had together and it's all sacred I'm a huge fan of crying i know grace has seen me cry a lot at her house <laughs> i was just sobbing on her picnic table the other day so i like to hear that when people are allowed to cry and it not be something that everyone feels like they have to fix yeah and that's yeah that's a big shift for me in the you know patriarchal structures that raised me as uh, structures um this this piece of fixing you know instead of just witnessing um grieving instead of fixing it's like it's it's uh yeah it, it, i feel like that's part of the domination i also think a big hero of mine is carlos Saavedra, who who's founded cosecha and the swarm training uh, co-found it with many other amazing um latino and latina leaders um in this this he said make sure you're solving practical problems like so it's not fixing but just all this energy like our whole western culture is so in our heads that we can be in rooms talking about racial justice and talking about the for for hundreds of hours where meanwhile ice is grabbing families and separating them. it's just that like 
white supremacy is also white perfection. Is that okay, we want to wait for the perfect thing so that we don't come in clumsily to a a, a group of a, a wide range of, of of gender expressions or racial expressions, or and that's where his invitation to just like solve a practical problem, go in there and learn, like be humble and receive feedback, and that's that's where we've just started. Like yeah, our our, our evolution of now doing reparations for. 10 years has dramatically shifted because we're practicing and we're, we're, we're making mistakes and we're trying to get resilient enough to accept the mistakes and not take it personally so that we can actually be uplifting and following the leadership of the people most getting hit by climate change and, and, and racism. Well, would you be willing to share a little bit more about how you have deepened your work with black and indigenous people of color, queer, trans, disabled, and other marginalized groups? Um, I know you mentioned on the phone when we talked a couple days ago that you are an all-white group that has now shifted, I think you said to be about one-third black and indigenous people of color and queer. Is that within like your network membership or advisory leadership type of roles or both? I was more curious about um, that. That number was for like our, our final permaculture uh, course, um, okay. which permaculture is a whole other conversation <laughs> with uh, privilege and cultural appropriation, but still honoring that it's a tool and a pathway out of empire. But that was the, the our final permaculture class. Um, there's a third of people that weren't identifying as white or heteronormative which was a shift from our first permaculture class that maybe it was one out of 20. So we created pathways of showing up in places in Detroit and other places during the water shutoff to, to, to show up and serve and, and follow the leadership and building trust. In my naivete, um, when we started the PM, like, we're going to have – the eco, there's no economics barrier. Like we'll even offer to help pay your transportation and we have your food and you can get permaculture certification. So on our first class, I was expecting, cause we had been connected to St. Louis and Kansas city that, that, uh, people of color and marginalized people were going to show up, but it didn't happen. Cause I realized there wasn't trust. You know, it, it, there had to be, uh, there had to be, showing up and showing that we were um, getting behind our words. It's easy for an organization to say we're for racial equality, we're for gender equality, we're for liberation, and it's something different to, to, to show up imperfectly to serve and, and follow. So that was the shift of the one-third, but um, currently, you know, our crew here is all white identifying, um, but at the same time, our project has so many more deep relationships um, with a wide series of individuals and groups. And, and the, what we're finding in other groups, like East Point Peace Academy and other amazing groups we've been able to uh, work with, um, that we find reparations have to come before reconciliation. Like if I if I have stolen something from you, and then I just show up and want to work together, it's just common sense that that's not going to go well. There has to be an act of atonement and reparations to start the healing, and so we found that we started to 20% of anything coming in we would send to um, indigenous and black-led organizations and queer and trans-led organizations, and just and in the letter saying like this is. This is this is returning what was taken from you for your liberation. Like this isn't uh, a gift. This isn't something that we should be held up for at all. This is just no matter what, even if it was if white to white transaction, it's the same for any human being. And as we started to do that, then um, after a couple months, um, people would reach out and and we, we'd get connected, and then that led to us visiting and then other people visiting and meeting someone. And, and I, like when I met Christine Nobis, she's like, come up to 
come up to Little River, um, Little Creek Camp. And so we responded. And one of the big pieces was when you're invited, show up. And when you're not invited, don't show up. You know, like making it a top priority for a project to respond when we're invited was a huge shift. We had to drop, you know, drop our own agenda and just say, okay, we're going to show up. We're coming up with building materials to help build this camp and whatever else you need. And that, that we have to change our priorities um, so that we can free up our life and, and drop our own project. And so that was one thing. And then realizing reparations can lead to reconciliation and that the end goal uh, is kinship. And the kinship and the reparations and the reconciliation, I, I feel myself has, has to totally be decided. The pace has to be decided by those who have been oppressed. And in some of those relationships, it takes five years to build trust, and sometimes it takes a month. And then I, the moment I start dictating the pace, I'm replaying a domination system. And so in kinship, I'm terrified of kinship. Because when I've read history in the civil rights movement, like what was true equality? And it was when people were showing up in Mississippi. And this is when co white college people were being killed in the South. And they were still showing up and hearing the African-American voices saying like, these white people coming down are sharing our oppression. They're stepping into it, not as a martyr or anything else, but like, I am here with you. And I don't think we can imagine, like going to Standing Rock, it was still phenomenal for people to be there in the water cannons and all, there's so much violence. But you think about like thousands of people were killed, bombed, murdered during the, the freedom movement, the black freedom movement. And uh, there were a lot of white people too. So you were, when you left Harvard University to go to the freedom ride, you, you were risking your life. And that's kinship. And that's terrifying that if I'm actually going to sincerely show up, not as an ally, but more of a accomplice or want kinship, that it's just like if my daughter was washing down a river, I'm going to jump in. Not because I'm a martyr, because we're family. Yeah. And so I don't, you know, even when I think of like, do, you know, friends of color, we're like, you really want kinship? And I'm like, I'm terrified, but yeah. We're going to pause it right there for now and let everyone take a little bit to digest this information from this first interview. And if you're ready, dive straight into the next episode. Episode 06, Kinship, is the continuation of this interview. Uh, we'll be getting a lot more into the heart of their organizing principles at the Possibility Alliance, as well as what it means to them to work in kinship and what that experience has been like uh, so far, what they've learned. So when you're ready, go ahead and hit play for the next episode, 06 Kinship, and you can hear all of that and more. Check out our show notes for links to all of the, or many of the resources mentioned in this episode, as well as contact information for the Possibility Alliance and Grace for Polywalk Farm. Those are going to be, the contact info will be in the show notes and also uh, discussed in the next episode. So yeah. I'd like to thank all of the musicians who gave their music for this episode, especially Binho Menenti, who helped us out with the soundtrack for the opening for every episode. Uh, thanks so much, Binho. And also Jazzy Robot, who's taken us out of this episode, and Taylor Greenshields and Anna Galmoka, who are both part of that project. So thanks for listening. The light in me honors and sees the light in each and every one of you. Namaste. Thanks for listening. You rock.